goals of today's presentation are to take a look at some of the basic theory behind stress analysis in an effort to build your confidence in the use of the stress analysis environment embedded in Autodesk Inventor Professional. We will also discuss where Inventor's capabilities end and NASH Training CAD's capabilities begin. First, some definitions. The finite element method is a numerical technique for finding approximate solutions to boundary value, blah, blah, blah. No, this is not how I want this presentation to go. Let's clarify that. Stress analysis is simply to study how loads affect physical structures and their components. Inventor Professional includes an environment called stress analysis, which uses the finite element method to perform these studies. This is also known as finite element analysis. In the next few minutes, I want to show you how Inventor uses FEA to perform stress analysis. Let's take, for example, this cantilever beam. Let's say I want to know how much this beam is going to bend downward due to the weight on the beam. Boom! The power of FEA saves the day. Yeah, except problems like this are really pretty easily solved by hand calculations, too. In the real world, our structural problems tend to be a bit more complex than a cantilever beam. Show me a hand calc that's going to predict this event. To be fair, this problem would be found on the extreme end of the FEA complexity scale, with my cantilever beam problem sitting on the other extreme. Most of your problems will fall somewhere in between the two. And no, inventor stress analysis won't do this. How does stress analysis, or FEA to use another name for it, how does FEA actually work? Let's start by breaking this up into five simple categories. Starting with the input, we take some defined geometry, which is your CAD model. We define what that geometry is made of, and we identify areas where the geometry is loaded and constrained. We feed all this into a solver, which in turn spits out results. You may have heard terms like pre-processing, which means the stuff at the front end, the setup, or post-processing, which is the part where we process the results and dig out the useful information. In the early days of FEA, these tasks, pre-processing, solving, and post-processing, were all handled by different software products. Some products still operate this way, but it's more common now to see all these functions rolled into a single interface as is the case with Inventor and NAS Training CAD. Let's look at the geometry piece. This is an element, the building block of the FEA model. This is a type called a beam, and it's meant to be a simpler way to represent real-world 3D objects, like this bar. These beam elements are available in Inventor Professional, by the way, but only if you have built the geometry using the frame generator. More commonly, in Inventor Stress Analysis, you'll be using 3D geometry. 3D geometry uses elements as well, it's just a different type. In this case, tetrahedral solid elements are used. The other important piece of FEA geometry is the node. This is where the elements connect to one another and where forces and constraints are applied. They are also the points where we get results back from the solver. I'm only showing you this beam element because that's about as simple as FEA gets, and I want to show you some of what's happening in the background in the solver using a simple model. More on that later. Next, the material box. In the case of my cantilever beam, all I need to know about my material is the elastic modulus. That's it, just one input. So what is it? This is a stress strain curve. If I performed a whole bunch of tests where I pulled on a piece of steel with a known force and measured how much it stretched, and then plotted it on a line graph, it would look something like this curve. Ductile metals, steel and aluminum in particular, display a nice straight line at the front end, or it's straight enough that we can assume it's straight. This region is known as the elastic region. It is so named because if I relieve the load at any point in this region, the material will snap back to its original shape. No permanent deformation or damage. This is the only type of material behavior that inventor stress analysis can simulate, and I'll get back to that later. The slope of this straight line, or its vertical distance divided by its horizontal distance, stress over strain, is the elastic modulus. It comes out to be a number with the same units as pressure, like PSI or Pascal. It's the stiffness of the material. And that's all I need for my beam analysis. 
If you're working in 3D, and you probably are, you'll also need Poisson's ratio. This just describes, for instance, how much my material sample shrinks laterally as I stretch it axially. These two properties, elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio, are the only required properties to solve a basic stress analysis in Inventor. You may need density if you want to consider body loads like gravity. The material library contained in Inventor already contains all this information. Next, loads and constraints. Let's say the cantilever beam is actually the boom of this jib crane. When I start to set up an analysis, my first step is to determine the scope of the analysis, or where the boundaries are. If all I want to know is how much my boom is going to bend when I load the hoist, I don't need to model the whole crane. My beam element will represent the portion of the boom that I care about, between the main support and the hoist position. Loads and constraints often replace parts of the model that I'm not concerned with. For instance, I'll ignore the main support and replace it with a fixed constraint at the left end of my beam. This just means that the left end is not allowed to move. I place it on the boundary of my analysis, which is why you'll hear them refer to as boundary conditions sometimes. I replace the hoist with a force that represents the load applied by the hoist onto my boom. Notice it's also on the boundary. The resulting FEA model will look something like this. And that's the idea. So we have all the pieces. We have the geometry, materials, and loads and constraints. When we hit the button to run the analysis, we send this information to the solver. So what happens then? It's not as magical as you might think, at least not when we're talking about the types of problems Inventor solves. F equals KD. This is the heart of FEA. F is our forces. K is the stiffness of the model. You could think of this as your geometry, materials, and constraints. All these things contribute to the picture of the structure's overall stiffness. And then there's D, which is our results. Actually, it's displacements, or in other words, how much did the structure move? This is typically our output, though, and from that we can derive lots of other fun things like stress and strain. In fact, the equation is more commonly arranged in this way. We feed the solver our forces and the stiffness, and it spits out the displacements. And that's it, folks. The fundamentals really are that simple. It gets a little more complex with 3D elements, but the basics are the same. And you might say, yeah, it looks like a simple equation, but what are those scary brackets around the terms? That's fair enough. I'll explain. F equals KD is just Hooke's Law. Mr. Hook did a lot of work describing the relationship between the amount of force you put on a spring and how much it stretches. He found the relationship was linear when displacements were relatively small. In other words, if you double the force, you get double the displacement. It's super simple, and it's the foundation of the analysis we use in Inventor. F is the force, K is the stiffness of the spring, or the spring constant, and D is the resulting displacement. The difference in FEA is that we have to consider more than one direction for loads and displacements. And so they are vectors, hence the fun little brackets. Also, we have to consider more than one element, not just a single spring. So K is a matrix. This matrix, you may hear the term stiffness matrix, drives how a load on one node affects that node and every other node in the structure. Okay. I know I'm getting a little geeky here, but I do have a point. Here's the whole process as the solver sees it. Here's our geometry and my materials. These build this stiffness matrix. I know it looks like a mess, and it kind of is, because we can't use it while it looks like this. We need to add our constraints, which cleans it up a little bit into a matrix that can be inverted. This is why you'll find that an unconstrained model, in most cases, simply won't solve. The method actually breaks down if the model is unconstrained. Anyway, our new constrained stiffness matrix and our forces get us out our final displacements. Again, this is just one element with two nodes. Look at a problem with three elements and three nodes. You can see this stiffness matrix is getting pretty hairy. Imagine your model running thousands of elements. And so to my point, 
If you have ever done anything like this by hand, you have learned only one thing, and that's you never want to do it again. And so we don't. Our computer does. Not because the fundamental concepts are super complex, but because real-world models would be extremely tedious. So what's it look like using Inventor? Let's tackle something a little more complex than a beam. We'll look at the crown of this bike fork assembly. The geometry will be more complex, but the fundamentals are the same. If you've never done this before, look at, for the Stress Analysis button on your Environments tab. This all runs right inside the Inventor interface. You kind of work your way from left to right on the Stress Analysis tab, following the five boxes we discussed earlier. We define our materials, which is already done if you have assigned a material to the CAD model, but you can override it with a new material if you want to explore that possibility without affecting the global model. Notice all the inputs are already there. Elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio. Why is this other stuff in there? Well, not for Inventor. We'll look at NAS Train NCAD in a bit, which supports more advanced analyses that take advantage of these other properties. Now we define the geometry. The CAD model is really just the beginning, and there's an important piece of the geometry input that I don't want to gloss over, and that's the mesh. Hit the Mesh View button to prompt Inventor to run the automatic mesher and allow us to look at it. This is a 3D mesh. This is a whole bunch of little tetrahedral volumes, the elements, that when stitched together kind of look like the part. This is actually what gets analyzed, not the CAD model. The bigger these elements are, the further the mesh tends to deviate from the actual shape. Look at the difference in the roundness of the holes, for example. The further you deviate from the real world shape, the further you tend to deviate from the real world behavior. Let me explain a bit. Now, I'm about to throw some more math up here, but it's just an analogy, okay? So bear with me. I think this helps to understand the importance of meshing. Let's say I want to know the area under this curve. Ideally, I know the function that creates the curve, and so I use some basic calculus and integrate to get what is effectively the exact answer. But what if I don't have a function that defines this curve? Just like I don't have a function that defines how my bike fork crown behaves under load. Well, I approximate. I approximate by rebuilding this complex problem by stitching together a bunch of simple problems. In this case, four rectangles. This I can solve. Length times width of each of the elements, add up the areas, and I have a pretty good approximation of the area under the curve. It's a good approximation, but it could be better. It can be better if I make the rectangles smaller. Now they adhere to the curve a little bit better, and there's a smaller difference between my approximation and the real world answer. The problem is it takes me twice as long to solve. This is always the trade-off. Accuracy versus runtime. Accuracy does not always improve with smaller elements, but in general it does. The question becomes, when is it not worth it? Doubling my effort to gain half a percentage of accuracy in this case. Just remember that FEA is a good approximation, and can be a really good one. It's a tool to help you make better decisions, and 100% accuracy is not required when you're comparing potential designs. This is, of course, a gross oversimplification of the concept, but I like things gross and simple. Back to work. I'll cut down my element size, and the holes in particular are much rounder. Without a major refinement, I have increased the quality of my geometry. So what's left? Constraints and loads. By selecting a face on the part and fixing it, I'm really applying a fixed condition to all the nodes in that area. Same with my force, which I'll apply here. This is ready to run. It's ready to send to the solver. Here we see an example of the kind of results we get back from the solver. Actually, the solver just feeds us the displacement of each node. Inventor then processes this information and makes it more readable. The default result after solving is the von Mises stress, which I'll discuss in a moment, but that result is derived from the displacement. It's important to note that another default behavior for the system is the visual exaggeration of the results. 
Inventor stress analysis is intended to solve relatively small displacements. Usually these displacements will be too small to see clearly if they were not exaggerated. So this is done to give us a better sense of what areas are moving the most and what direction they're going. Most results in FEA are displayed as color contours, with a color painted on the model that corresponds to a real value, according to the legend on the left. Again, this is all to make the results more readable, even to those untrained in the mechanical arts, like salespeople. The most commonly used result in 3D stress analysis is von Mises stress. What is it? Well, there's a lot going on inside a real 3D object under load. If you were to take a sample of the material, imagine an infinitely small cube out of the object, you would find tension and compression stresses in three principal directions and shear stresses across those principal directions. They can add up to be more than the sum of their parts, so to speak. In other words, all those individual stress components, or tensors, could be under the yield stress for the materials, but when their effects are combined, they may be over the yield limit. Von Mises simplifies this by boiling all these factors down into a single value, which is described in the same units as pressure. The intent is to compare this value to your failure criteria, most commonly yield strength. If your Von Mises stress is below the yield strength, you're still in the elastic range. If you're above it, you're permanently deforming the part, which usually means failure. There are, of course, times when you'll want to study those individual tensors, and that's possible. But Von Mises is very commonly used in design decisions and is widely accepted in the industry. The stress analysis tools built into Inventor Professional do have their limits. Inventor is a great starting point for FEA, but as you use it more, you'll likely run up against one or more of these limitations. Stress analysis is also known as linear static stress, or LSS for short. That's the name of the analysis type, and it's a staple of every analysis package and most CAD systems these days. That's because it's the most commonly used analysis type there is, and for good reason. It's relatively easy to use, and it can aid you in predicting the outcome of a wide variety of problems. Its limitations can be found right in its name. Firstly, it's linear. It's linear in a couple of key ways. Remember our stress strain curve and the elastic region? I told you Inventor only simulates the behavior of materials in this range. The limit of this range is the yield point, where the material behavior enters the plastic region. This is where permanent deformations occur. So when the load is relieved, the part does not snap back to its original shape. Inventor, and really any analysis using the linear material models, don't know anything about this region. They'll give you an answer because they just assume that the straight line in the elastic region continues on forever. So you'll get an answer, just not a good one. If your stresses are exceeding yield strength, or really, if they're even getting close to yield strength, you should be graduating to a nonlinear analysis type. Here's another key way that linear means linear. Take this frame and load it with this force. We'll call it F1. This force's direction is in line with the rightmost structural member. This bar is very strong when loaded along its axis. In other words, it's very stiff. F1 will have little effect on the structure. But what if we add force F2? This force acts to pull on the central horizontal member putting a bend in the rightmost member. Now that it's bent, it has much less strength against a vertical force like F1. F2 heavily influences the structural stiffness resisting F1. LSS will not consider the change in the structure's stiffness after the loading is applied. It only considers the loading as it applies to the original shape. And so again, you'll get an answer from LSS, but not a good one. This is why we say that one of the criteria for an accurate model in inventor stress analysis is that the displacements are small. How small? That's very subjective, unfortunately. That's why it's nice to have a nonlinear solver available. If you're unsure, you can run it in both and see if there's a big difference in the results. If there's no big difference, you had a linear problem to begin with. If there is, then it's a good bet that the nonlinear solution is more realistic. What's the next word in that name? static. This basically means that the problem is perfectly balanced. The loads applied to it are fully resisted by the constraints holding it in place. They are in equilibrium. This means no motion. 
It also assumes your loading is applied slowly, so there is no shock in response to shock. Some other commonly reached limitations. Loading cannot change direction, so think pressure against a severely deforming vessel, and how the force needs to change direction to stay normal to the inside surfaces. Time is not modeled. LSS shows you the result as though an infinite amount of time has passed, and a balance has been found, and nothing is moving anymore. Materials where strength is dependent on direction of loading, like composites, cannot be modeled, so no carbon fiber, fiberglass, or wood. LSS is really best suited to ductile metals and certain stiff plastics. And one of the most common reasons people graduate to a more advanced tool is thermal. If you want to run heat transfer problems or thermal stress problems, Inventor can't help you. But let's not end on a negative note. When Inventor can't help you, what can? Meet Autodesk NASTRAIN NCAD. What is NASTRAIN NCAD? Autodesk NASTRAIN NCAD is the power of the NASTRAN solver embedded in your CAD system. So what's NASTRAN? NASTRAN is a general purpose FEA solver. In the 1960s, NASA developed NASTRAN in an effort to standardize FEA solver codes, which were then in their infancy. The result was the code that NASA used to bring the U.S. to the leading edge of the space age. NASA released this code into the public domain, where it has since evolved that is now the basis of some of the industry's finest and most respected FEA software platforms, including NASTRAN NCAT. Autodesk NASTRAN is proven and credible, providing accurate results for advanced linear, nonlinear, dynamics, and heat transfer analysis. So let me break all that down. NASTRAN NCAD basically takes the place of the solver technology that comes with Inventor Professional. It's far more capable, and frankly it's been around longer, and so is more well known and trusted in the industry. It's available for multiple CAD platforms, not just Inventor. It's a networked license, so it can be shared by multiple users in an organization. Basically, the CAD environment that designers and engineers are already familiar with becomes the pre-processor for setting up simulations and the post-processor for reviewing results and this eliminates the need for a standalone simulation software package. Autodesk NAS Training CAD supports a wide array of analysis types. Linear static stress and normal modes are commonly found in embedded simulation systems, and that's all you'll find in Inventor. I didn't touch on normal modes, maybe in another presentation. NAS Training CAD takes it to the next level, with advanced nonlinear, static and transient stress, dynamic response, and thermal analysis types.